Hi folks, welcome to my presentation room in the Scooby car. Um, by the way, it's been two years since the COVID situation and all the CubiCon events are still virtual this year again. So hopefully um, just everything will be over really soon and I do hope everyone to be safe and well wherever you are living in or working in. Um, okay, let's get on to our business today. And the topic of my presentation is API Server Builder, extending Kubernetes pair and aggregated API Server. Um, my whole presentation is going to start with a very detailed introduction about the technique of API server aggregation per se. Um, and in, in the next one, we're going to expand the details about the subproject named API Server Builder and also its successor new subproject named API Server Runtimes. And in the end, there will also be a Q&A section in which I will be addressing all the questions from you, um, if there's any. And the time is limited, so um, we can probably extend our Q&A sections to the Slack channels. Over there, you can just DM me or whatever you want. And, okay, um, I'm gonna start with a brief introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Min Jin, and I'm a software engineer working at Alibaba Clouds. And, and I'm also a Kubernetes maintainer working in SIG API machinery. Um, the subproject owner of multiple Kubernetes subprojects. And I'm also the speaker of Kubica um, 2019 Europe, 2019 North America, 2020 North America. And besides Kubernetes, I'm also actively running the project of Open Cluster Management. Um, I also maintain the, um, um, the API server aggregation related libraries for almost four years. And um, you can contact me via my uh, mailbox or, in, or just mention me in the GitHub or DM me in the Slack channels or Discord. Um, so I outlined my presentations into basically five parts. Um, the first is the background around the API server aggregation in which I will um, sharing the um, basic fundamental knowledge of the technique and then we will sort off the history of API server aggregation subprojects, um, the evolution of API server, then code builder and the controller runtimes. And in the third part, I will um, announce the new project of API server runtime, um, which is incubated by the um, from, from the API server builders, um, similar to, to the similar um, to the um, relationship between the Kubi builder and controller runtime. And in the first part, I will have a um, demo of how um, API server runtime works. And um, there are also um, a few projects I will, I will show you. Um, in the end, um, I, will, um, I will share with you the future roadmaps of these projects. Um, okay, let's move on to the second part of, not to the, sorry, the first part of um, my presentation. Um, it's the background of our um, API server application. Over the years of community support, um, I found many developers are stuck in um, a builder complaining that a technique is too complicated to understand. Um, and most of them are stuck in at the, um, for example, the installation of API server applications or the, um, the, man the management of certification and or something like that. So today um, in this part, I will be elaborating the details about how the um, API server application works and um, to share, share the detail of the fundamental knowledge with you guys. So um, the AA, AA is actually the, um, um, the acronym of API server application. And um, it's, a, it's a API um, runs beta in 1.6 and graduated into GA since 1.10. And from the, from the perspective of a user, the um, AA works by registering one resource named API service into the Kubernetes cluster. And in the in the spec of um, API service, you can specify the endpoints of the a server instances, or you can just pass in a reference of the service. Then the Kubernetes cluster will automatically resolve the endpoints for you. Um, as for how to build an a server, um, there are basically three physical approaches. The first one is just um, copy and pasting from another official project named Sample API Server. And, but the project is actually hard coded. So um, you will have to edit the, for example, the resource name of the, um, the, 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 uh, the, the AE servers. And the second approach is, um, 
extending the API servers where the um, scaffolding is provided by the API server builder, um, which will be um, similar to the user, user experience of how Kubi Builder works. And um, the, the, the third phase, by the way, will be just um, importing the, the libraries of API server runtime, which I will um, elaborate later. Um, you can just um, initialize a brand new Golang project and just um, add the API server runtime into the dependency list, and um, uh, the, the, the magic will happen. Um, um, as for uh, as for the insights of a API server applications, we're gonna expand the um, the internal technique from four aspects: um, the authentication and the authorization, emission controls, and Last but not least, the API priority fairness. Um, by, by leveraging the technique of AA, you can um, basically do any kinds of customizations if you want. Um, for example, you can even replace the persistent layer for an API server. Um, the, um, normally, uh, the storage layer of an API server is, is supposed to be ETCD, but you can um, you, by, by, by leveraging AA, you can just replace it with any kinds of other storage if you want. And this picture shows how an AA works um, in the architecture. So um, an AA server is a standalone API server outside of Kubi API server. And by the spec of um, API service, you can um, make the traffic going through the Kubi API server um, successfully proceed to to the um, to the downstream of AA servers, and um, you can even develop your custom controllers working based on the um, AA servers. The the custom so controllers are supposed to connect AA servers um, via the proxy to the API server instead of um, requesting directly. However, um, di direct requesting will also be working, um, which I will also be explaining later. So before we dive into the authentication of API server application, we have to um, understand how the TLS, the general technique of TLS works. Basically, there are two kinds of TLS in, in, the, in, 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 the, in the world. Um, the first is vanilla TLS, or we can call it the simple TLS, which is um, widely used in the, um, in the um, HTTPS servers. Um, in the vanilla TLS, the only verific verific verification that happens is that um, when the client is um, trying to um, request downloading contents from a server, then the server will be returning its server certificates to back to the clients. Then the clients can 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 check uh, can check the signer CA, the authority of the server certificates, and check whether the CA is seen in the client's trusted list. And and also the clients can verify the ser server certificates SAN. Um, which is um, the, the SAN stands for um, subject um, alternative names, which is a list of domain names or IP addresses. Um, so so the, the SAN basically restricts the usage of, uh, of a server certificates. And as for the um, mutual TLS, um, in addition to um, vanilla TLS, uh, the, the, uh, the mutual TLS has another rounds of verifications which is um, the, 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 the server will also verify the, um, the client certificates from, from the clients. Um, so, so there's a, there's a trusted um, authorities um, in memory inside of servers. Um, the, the servers is supposed to reject any, any request that doesn't, doesn't contain, doesn't have the um, client certificates signed by that CA. So this is basically how the mutual TIS works. Um, in the, in the end, there's also an a optional step of verifying the client's SAN, but actually in the, in the um, Kubernetes native libraries, it's um, skipped by default. Hmm. Okay, after, um, after knowing how TIS works, let's take a look at how authentication works. Um, this picture is um, the typical case when a client is trying to request a AA server via the proxy of Kubi API server. So um, the normal authentication happens between the, between the Kubi Kato and the Kubi API server. The, um, the Kubi API server will, 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 um, will check whether the client certificate is signed by um, a, a CA authorities, which is specified by a flag named the dash dash client CA file. 
And um, however, th um, this is rather simple, uh, but however, uh, let's take a look at the um, authentications, the mutual TLS happens between the Kubi API server and the aggregated API server. The AA server um, um, is actually, is, um, sorry, the Kubi API server is actually, is, is the client when, when proxying the request to the AA servers. So um, the client ver verification happens when um, the AA server returning the server certificate back to the Kubi API server. Um, so the, the Kubi API server will check whether the server certificates of AA server is signed by the, um, the, 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 the CA bundles specified in this API service. And the AA server will also perform another round of server ver verifications by um, checking whether the client certificates from the Kubi API servers are uh, checking the, the client certificates um, is this signed by the CA, CA authorities specified by the um, dash dash request header um, CA client file the, the flag. And optionally, uh, if the A servers are deployed inside of Kubernetes clusters, you can also looking for a config map under the namespace of Kubi system and name extension API server authentications. Um, there's a key named the request header CA file, then um, the content will be the um, the, the expected um, signer of client certificates. And this is the um, this is the indirect approach when a client is accessing any servers where the proxy of Kubernetes server. However, a client can also access a, a server directly without the result proxy by the Kubernetes server. Well, in this case, um, um, the case can be different when the clients, if a client is um, requesting using a um, signed certificate, then the Kubi API, then the aggregated API server will just checking whether the um, the the client certificates by um, by by um, by the uh, by by the, by the CA authorities passed from the flags dash dash client CA file, which is um, identical to the flags of Kubi API server, and the A server will also be looking for. Um, the the config map under the Kubi system, the same config map, but the key is um, client dash ca dash file, um, which um, which is happening inside of when when it's deployed, um, inside of Kubernetes clusters, and um, repeat it, repeat it again. The A servers will just um, um, will just verify whether the uh, client certificate is signed by this CA, and however, if if the client is um. Um, the credential, if the credential is um, service account tokens, the AA servers will, will do not understand how to verify the SA tokens for some reasons. So instead of verification in memory, you just delegate the um, verification of service, service account tokens back to the Kubi API servers where an API named token review. And um, after, after um, getting the response from Kubi API server, um, the A server will know whether the tokens are valid or not. So this is how the authentication works between Kubi API server and A server, uh, which is a bit complex than than the uh, than the um, simple Kubi Kato um, Kubi API server authentication. Then after the authentication, the 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 next the 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 the, the, right, the, 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 the next thing happen is the authorization. The authorization works inside a server is um, um, pretty easy. Um, first of all, for clarification, the Kubi API server will just forwarding all the requests to a servers without performing any kinds of, of authorization check. So all the authorization checks are happening inside of a servers, but um, the, the a server doesn't contain any logic of authorization. So uh, again, the uh, a servers will be delegating the authorization back to the Kubi API server. Um, via a dedicated API named the set subject access review. And the results of um, authorization check will be caching inside of um, a servers. And, and also we can also um, wipe off the authorizations in the A servers, but this is strongly not recommended because this will be um, leaving the um, leaving, leaving the A servers unprotected, can be um, attacked by hackers or and Similar to authorizations, the emission controls inside of AA also happens by delegating the 
called a mission control request to the back to the Kubi API server. The Kubi API server do not perform any any kinds of um, emission controls upon receiving requests. It just, instead, it just proxy redirect the request to AAs. And um, and after that, the AA servers can either execute the built-in emission controllers, um, such as namespace controllers or resource coders and hooks, or the AA servers can just um, delegate the emission controls back, back to the Kubi API server we are in similar API named emission review. And we can also wipe out the emission controllers inside of AA, but um, this is still not recommended. But disabling the authorization and emission controllers can, can sometimes can be um, useful, helpful when you are debugging in, in your local environment, because um, sometimes you just don't, don't, don't need that um, sec security check. Um, you just when you just want to um, verify the logic of your API servers, and this is how everything works in a piece on the host view. The when it, um, the but when 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 the Kubi Kato sends a request to Kubi API server, the this is how authentication works. Um, it just works in the flow. Um, the mutual TLS between clients and Kubi API server, then the mutual TLS between the Kubi API server and the AA servers. And then um, upon authorization, the AA servers will be delegating the authorizations back to Kubi API server and returning the responses. Then um, in terms of mission control, um, aggregated API server delegates again, then the responses are returned. Um, and finally, the AA servers will be returning the actual result back to the clients. And there's also a advanced feature named APF um, added to Kubi API server and AA servers since uh, 1.18, um, but and, and it's also uh, beta since 1.20, which means that the feature will be enabled by default. So this can be useful uh, for you to understand how APF works um, between the Kubi API server and the AA servers. So in the original design of APF, we disabled the flow controls by default so that um, um, in order to avoid cyclic lookups or the cyclic um, dependencies between Kubi API servers and AA servers. So um, every request will be queued just for only once inside of Kubi API server or aggregated API server. Um, as it's shown in the picture, the, um, the request will be um, queued on, upon its first arrival at the Kubi API server, then queued again inside of AA servers upon arrival. But the, however, the delegated authorization will never be throttled, and because of um, this will be classified into the exam priority class. Also, um, the emission control will not be throttled. Okay, after understanding the, the details of implementation of AA servers, let's um let's uh, uh, take a step back and um take a take a look at uh, the CRDs uh in a higher level. Let's take a comparison between the CRDs and AA. Um the CRD is basically a declarative API, however, the AA is implemented. Um though by by, by the declarative API we can easily Define um, the schema of CR, CRDs by using the grammar of, of OAS or the old swagger. And but there are some inconvenience when we are trying to um, do um, develop a multi-version CRDs. Um, the CRD has a mechanism of conversion by book. However, this can be um, somehow um, difficult to develop one because um, it requires. Um, much more um, background knowledge of how Kubernetes API works. And as for sub-resources, CRDs only have skilled sub-resource and status sub-resource. So when you are trying to extend your arbitrary sub-resources, then AA will be probably something you are looking for. And um, the, the, um, the technique AA can help us to replace the ETCD um, as the um, persistent layer. We can we can build an A working based on MySQL or other kinds of SQL storages. 
or even you can be working on a local file pass. Um, and but um, the dark side of AA is that uh, we're gonna define our schemas in Golang, and it requires a actual local code, coding, and um, this can be uh, this can be uh, um, more costly comparing to just writing a YAML in your local computers. And um, so uh, after the comparison, I have some personal suggestions um, for choosing between CLDs and A. Um, the, the rule number one, if you are extending a trivial custom resources, or for example, if you, if you are just trying to structuralize the schema of your custom resource, um, then you can, you, can, you can try CRDs. However, um, if you are looking for offloading API calls from Ruby API servers, for example, to, um, for example, to, um, to get some data out of the um, main ETCD clusters, um, if, you, if you want your AA servers working on a dedicated ETCD clusters, and this will, this will be offloading some ETCD within write costs. Um, and also there will be, um, if you're using AA, the, um, the, the, the cost, the burden of Ruby API server will be um, will be will be reduced in a, in a sense. And also, if you are um, trying to develop a specialized API, for example, extending um, custom sub resources such as proxy, um, the proxy sub resources is um, is already used in in the in, um, in the Kubernetes such as um, pods proxy service proxy. So if you are um, looking for a custom proxy um, implementation or other any kinds of um, sub, sub resources, then um, you should probably try A. And also, if you are um, if you want to get rid of etcd storage, I think the A will be the only choice to go. Um, so by replacing the storage layer of the etcd, we can um, easily encapsulate a third party APIs into Kubernetes resource and also um, adapting, adopting other kinds of uh, other types of storages and even um, integrates your legacy systems into the Kubernetes clusters. And let's move on to our second part, um, the evolution um, of API server to Kubebuilder from the controller runtime to API server runtime. So in the past, there are a bigger general um, debates between CRDs and AA. And um, the um, at that time the CRDs and they they are they are neither mature and um, developers are having trouble um, um, getting on board any 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 of techniques. So the Kubi builder is actually um, trying to providing users say um, converging obstruction layer that eliminates the gaps between CRDs and A. So the users will be just um, facing running running on the obstructions. Um, Provided by the Kubi builder or API server builders, and make let let the um, builders do all the rest to to do the to do the dirty things for you. Um, the the second goal will be scaffolding. The scaffolding um, basically covers um, first of all is the templating of your um, projects, no matter it's um, controller or in a servers, and also we need a scaffolding to setting up um, the local testing environment. Um, in, the, in the past, um, setting up having a local environment is so a actually a luxury thing uh, because um, um, it, it involves too many dependencies. But for now, we have the KND projects, which help us to um, easily customize, develop our um, own, own um, Kubernetes clusters. Um, and the, uh, the builders, the API server builders are also trying to provide users a uh, user-friendly API concepts that's, uh, that's um, hiding some complicated details uh, from the users. So as you can see in the peak, actually the Kubi builder is uh, um, forked from the API server in the very beginning. The picture is the um, very first value commit of Kubi builders. So the original idea is that um, the, Kubi, the, the Kubi builders is supposed to learning all the defects, learning the failing lessons from the API servers, then uh, have a better um, building toolings uh, for, for the developers. 
And after the Kubi builder, then we have the controller runtime. Um, this this picture shows how how the um, how how is the controller runtime evolving over time. Um, in the very beginning, the only thing we have is a project named Sample Controller. The Sample Controller is um, very well documented, but it's not user friendly for developers because um, you will need to um, re read the internals, yeah, and every every developers may have the, their own um, understanding of how a controller works. Um, after a period of time, um, we, we extracted a Go template from the sample controller. So um, we, don't, we don't have to manually copy and paste it from the sample controllers anymore, but it's still not user-friendly because um, we don't have a unified abstraction of controller. So um, in, the, in the end, we had, so, so, we, so we initiated a project of controller runtimes, if you notice, uh, many packages inside of controller runtimes are, um, are defined as Golang's internal packages. Um, and that's the point of um, hiding the internals, the hiding the underneath um, details from the users as much as possible. And controllers, controller runtimes have, uh, have a few, uh, have, have a standardized interface of a controller. And it's a you non know, easy, it's an easy SDK framework for developing and testing. Um, yes, the testing is also covered in the controller runtime. However, however there are the dark side of controller runtime is that some packages is conflicting with the uh, native libraries from the Kubernetes. Um, but in, um, sometimes um, the, the, the diverging can be misleading um, because um, um, sometimes the, the obstructions in the controller runtime are just not correct anyway. And by learning from the success of Kubi Builder and the controller runtime, we made um, a new project named API Server Runtimes. Um, so the name is similar. So I think you you, you can get it. Um, the first draft of API Server Runtime is drafted in 2018 um, by by the um, by, by the founder of Controller Runtime, Soli, and um, the source is still available in his repositories. And now it's incubating into a official Kubernetes six project, um, which is now um, publicly available here. And the different thing um, comparing to the control runtime is that the API server runtime is completely honoring the original implement original implementation of a sample API server. Um, it works by just um, importing the sample API servers into the API server runtimes, and um, then the API server ha ha has its own lightweight um, overriding layer or a obstruction layer of, over the sample API servers for users to be working on. And um, as you can see in the link, the sample API servers is um, inlined into um, API server runtimes as an internal package. So users will not be, um, don't, 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 don't have to care about the API server runtimes but still um, getting help from the sample API servers. And um, after, after um, telling the evolution of the projects, um, let's clarify the scope of API servers and API server runtimes. Um, overall, the API servers will be a project um, doing scaffoldings for API server runtime, which is similar to the relationship between code builder and controller runtime, and also um, um, the API server builder provides users a set of um, useful utilities, the, the command lines to um, operate the AA servers uh, inside your Kubernetes clusters. As for templating or the code generations, note that the API server builders will only do those one-shot code generations for you, including the project initializations or adding your custom resources. Um, all of these work will just happen once and it's not consistent. And um, um, as for the scope of API server runtime, um, the, it's um, aiming at being a user-friendly library for building a graduated API server. And it's also providing um, one lightweight tooling for code generations, which is the consistent code generations. Um, not comparing to the API server, the API server does one type things, but um, in the API server runtimes, the, the code generation is also is actually 
um, referencing the original um, code generators such as um, deep copy generator and conversion generator, um, cry generator, informer, informer and list generators. Um, the, 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 the aim of API server runtime jam is just um, saving, saving your time by um, you, you don't need to download all, all the binaries on your own anymore. Then let's take a look at how the original sample API server works um, in, the, in the code from the code code wise. Um, in, in the code, um, you can see that the REST storage implementation is um, initialized, um, is in, instantiated manually in the code. Um, you need to organize all, organize all the resources into a into a Golang map, which is uh, a bit hard to understand. Then you can just um, install the um, API groups into the generic API servers. Um, but ideally, we hope users not to uh, don't, don't touch any um, internal details like this. Um, instead, in the API server runtimes, um, we we developed a fluent builder flow for developing a aggregated API server. Um, we call this um, the fluent builder flow or one life flow. Um, this is pretty common in the in the Java world. So we found this it's really useful. So we just decided to um, moving moving it to the Golang world. So um, as you see, um, we can just um, build our own custom servers in one line by just by registering the resources and um, tuning a few configurations. And we can also um, adjust the um, flag registrations or other. Um, the, there are many. Um, the, the extensibilities are sufficient for, um, for for your custom use. And also by the API server runtimes, we can um, develop our new Kubernetes resources by um, one line API service um, interface assertions. Um, if your if your um, ID is supported, you can just um, assert your custom API types with a resource for um, object interface and assert your list type with a resource for object list interface. Then, um, then after you um, you make the um, interface assertion works, then um, the, 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 the new Kubernetes A resources are supposed to working like a charm. And optionally, this is the mandatory the required um, step of developing a um, custom resources. But however, there are some op optional steps of um, advanced um, customizations. For example, the validators, you can assert your custom type with uh, a interface named validator. Then in the, in the interface, in the implementation of validator, you can do advanced logics like cross field validations or um, any kinds of non-trivial validations if you want. And, and um, this picture also shows you the, uh, how to develop a non-native non CD API servers using the API server runtimes. Um, the, 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 uh, um, as you can see, uh, in the in the builder flow, we can call without etcd methods. Then this will be completely disabling etcd related settings and flags from the custom servers. And then if we uh, replace the storage layer um, with something other than the etcd, then the, the server will be running completely etcd free. Then let's move on to the demo. The class um, by by the API server runtimes, the cluster gateways will be um, easily um, developing any kinds of um, sub resources. Um, this time, it's going to be the connector sub resource or the proxy sub resource. Um, as you can see in the picture, um, I asserted the sub resource with an interface named connector. Then, um, in the implementation of connectors. Uh, the connect method will just returning a HTTP dot handler, the um, registered APIs under this group. Um, after um, after setting up the AA, the, the connection between Kubi API servers and AA, then the Kubi API servers will be understanding um, there are uh, inside of AA, there's a new resource named the cluster gateways, and um, they, uh, there's a uh, sub resource named proxy. First of all, I'm going to show you how to crawl, crawl the healthiness of cluster VELADEV um, using the process of resource. 
okay, this is how the proxy sub result works. Um, the, 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 the proxy sub results will be directing, redirecting all the requests under the, under, under, under the proxy sub resources to the, to the actual real cluster. Um, okay, I will leave my time to the uh, last Q&A sections. So if you have any questions, I think this is a media record, but when, um, during my presentation, I will also be available in the presentation room. So feel free to ask any questions if you like. Thank you.